Well, I haven't been here for a while, so it's good to be back, see some old faces. Uh, now, when I spoke to Russell about this talk, and um, we came up with this title, actually, a lot of this talk is not about writing stuff in Groovy. It's actually about a lot of the tools on the JVM that you can use, which are, will make your life a lot easier, but which will all actually enable through the use of Groovy. And that's pretty much what I'm going to focus on. So there's going to be a little bit of talking, quite a bit of slides, quite a bit of code, um, and you can stop me and ask questions, and we can try stuff, and we'll see how it goes along. Right, so I'm not going to talk about too much about myself. Nowadays, you can find a lot of stuff online. So that's my Twitter handle. And from there, you can go and find enough about it. Anyway, if you take the Twitter handle, you Google that, I'm sure you'll find enough stuff. So we'll leave it at that. I do a lot of stuff in sort of the, the groovy universe, quite a bit of stuff in the JVM nowadays. Uh, it's just by the, the nature of how things have worked out. I think it actually really makes life for developers on the JVM a lot easier and for testers. And this is the kind of things I like to talk about and um, evangelize. So let's get on with it. Uh, but the first tool I actually want to talk about is the tool called SDK Man, which isn't actually anything to do with Groovy. It's written in Bash. And there's a reason why this is actually important, because this is a tool by which you can install a lot of stuff, and, uh, well, infrastructure and stuff, on your own machine and manage the versions. And you will actually see it. Now, it started from the Groovy environment, because it was originally called GVM, the Groovy Environmental Manager. Uh, that's its history, and it, wants, it was sort of based on the Ruby environment manager, so that's where it got its idea from. But it's actually a lot more than that. It primarily focuses on the JDK environment, but you can actually really do any tool with it. There's an open API, so if, you want, if you're actually an open source and you want to publish tools and you want to be managed through this, you can actually get an API key and make your build process actually already um, publish your new version. There's no interaction, it just gets announced automatically and it gets tweaked. That whole process is automated. It's pretty sleek. So let's have a quick look at what it is. Um, as I said, it's typically to manage multiple versions of SDKs that you have. Uh, it's Linux-based and Mac-based, etc. So if you're a Windows user, there's an alternative version called Posh GVM, which you can use as PowerShell-based. But now that we hear that Windows 10 Bash is coming, we might actually have this natively supported. We shall see. Now, the simplest way to install it is just to call the basic Bash script off and run it. Now, if you're going to say, oh, I don't like running this kind of script, there, then just download it, check the Bash script. It's very simple, and then you can install it. But let's have a look at what you can do here. Um, we're just going to pop over and get a, see if we can get a console up, well, that's not there yet. <coughs> right, there we go. So, it's a simple tool once installed. I'll make sure, no, this is there. yes, it's right there. So, it's just getting run by a command line tool called SDK and I can just list, and it will actually start listing all of the kind of candidates that you can install today. Uh, there are things like, you can see a couple of there, but some common things would be like Ant and Maven, ASCII Doctor, the Salon language, the Kotlin language, uh, Groovy, etc., and like the Crash Shell, etc. You can do all of those kind of things. So there's a lot of tools there, but if you want to have a specific version, so I can say, show me all of the versions of Groovy, and it will actually come up, and we'll find it. You'll see there's a lot of versions listed. This is all the ones you can actually install by S um, SDK Man. The one with stars are the ones that's actually installed on my machine. And then you can't actually see the other one because the screen is so small. Let's see if we can get to that. Uh, there's the one up there with a little greater than sign. That's actually say the one's currently active. So if I run Groovy minus version, that's going to show that's 2.4.5, but I don't want to use that version. Let's use 2.3.3. You can just say SDK use Groovy. Now, let's run it again. I have Groovy in my shell. 
different versions. So what's really useful about this is you can play with different versions of a tool. Uh, you can quickly switch versions. So I do a lot of Gradle development. Sometimes something doesn't work in one version of Gradle. Sometimes I found a bug. I can actually quickly test it by just switching the version of Gradle and do the test. So it's very useful if you want to play with different versions. So you want to go install it? That would be a little tip that I can leave with people. Um, and a lot of the things I'm going to talk about, you can actually do this way. And some of the other ones are obviously going to be just libraries. We'll do it a bit differently. But there are a couple of uh, commands and things you can run, but that's a simple kind of thing. So if you want to install, you just say like SDK install Gradle space 2.12, and it installs that version for you. Is that like system-wise or? No, user. It's for the user. Yeah. Um, well, it won't switch it system-wide. It will only switch it for that user. Uh -huh. So you, you can't, it, it's not installed globally. So that makes it useful for people to, if you actually have to share a machine, you have their own version. But I actually like this approach because you get too much burn by installing the single global version. But to some extent, it's like the Ruby one, we can switch versions. But I'm not sure if the Ruby one can switch it system wide. No, 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 the, the question is more like when I have two projects and one is in one directory, one is in the other, just hmm. command line entering that directory changes the version I'm, I'm in to the version of that project. No, so this way you will have to run it in two consoles. Okay. Yeah, so you can go find this actually, it's SDK man IO. Uh, the posh one is a different directory. And there is a Twitter account, which, uh, if you have questions, just send it there. But it actually announces any new version that comes out of any um, SDK that's associated with it. Right. So we're going to talk about Groovy. And the first part I really want to just cover is bits and parts of Groovy, which makes it really useful and why writing DSLs is so easy. And now, the one thing about Groovy is people just think it's like a dynamic language. It's actually dynamically typed and statically typed. You can choose what you want to do. And it is also, it has a REPL loop, so you can just run a console with it and try stuff out, which is great. But the question is actually, how many people here have never, well, yeah, how many people have never written Groovy? Okay. Written Java? Sorry? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that, that will count. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in Groovy, pretty much a couple of things if you compare it to Java. The syntax, to some extent, you will recognize. If you do Java, you can rec recognize what happens in Groovy. It just becomes a lot easier. First thing is all of your classes are public by default. All of your data members are public by default. And you can force the scope to something else if you want. Uh, there's no need to write getters and setters. You can write them if you need to, because sometimes you need to do something special. You can do that. But if you write, write a standard groovy bean, it is a very, very simple class. And then there's other thing that people come across. There's a little word, keyword DEF, which just means object. So it's the same thing as a Java generic object. Now, if we want to call method, if you look at the top class, which you pretty much recognize, that looks very, very close to Java anyway, except that's public. So we'll instantiate that foo object. But now we can actually start calling the bar method on foo. And the first way is the standard way you would sort of recognize from many places. But now with Groovy, you can stop dropping a lot of the um, extra symbols off it. So I can just write it with other parentheses. Really makes it a little bit easier to write. Then it's got this other kind of concept you can do is like you can shorten the context. And I can say foo.wolf and I can write a whole block in curly braces, and it will delegate all of the scores back to the foo object. So now like calling bar becomes a lot shorter. And this concept of delegation I will cover a bit later. But you can start seeing that part of the thing is actually dropping all of this extra syntax makes it a bit more readable. Now, in the same way, we can actually have closures. Now, in Groovy closures, is a bit like a C++ function object. Um, or what you now got in Java 8, like a lambda, except it reads a lot easier than a lambda. 
um, and it's been there long before Java Lake ever got Lambda. Now, there's a couple of nice things you can do with that. The first thing is if you've got a method that takes a closure as a parameter, it takes a closure as the last parameter, you don't have to call it inside the braces. So traditionally, you might have to call something like a first food or bar line there and have to put your closure code inside the parentheses, but you see that's ugly. You can actually drop it down and just write it outside of the braces, or if you drop the, the parentheses completely, just put a comma and you can actually call the closure. Now it starts reading a lot easier. Uh, and this is typically where you want to create functions on the fly and quickly do something with it. A very nice, simplistic way to write it. This is the kind of things that start feeding into some other tools that we're going to talk about. And this, if you see some of the tools, you say, wow, that's very short and now it's done. <coughs> the magic is this kind of thing that Groovy supports. Now, with maps in Groovy, it, you don't have to define big classes or anything. Just put square brackets and put all your key value pairs in there and separate them by colon. And when you actually call methods that take a map as a parameter, you don't have to put the square brackets in there. You just write it like this. And you can drop the parameters completely. I mean, the last one, exactly the same kind of thing. There's the apply function that sits on, say, a project class. And it takes a map as a parameter. And I just say apply plugin Java. The same thing with list. Like on a list, we don't have, don't need to put a colon sign because there's no key value pairs. You can just make a list, put it in square brackets, and uh, separate it by um, commas. And if you want to change it to something else, like a set or something, that's very easy. But that's, that's pretty much as simple as to do. Once again, you can call a method, and there's no parenthesis in it. Just pass it in like it is. OK. I, I mentioned this thing earlier about closure delegation and the WIF method that you can use. Now, where Groovy's closures are really, really funky is that those closures have extra sort of metadata on them or properties, and you can do a couple of fancy things with it. You can tell it if it doesn't resolve a symbol within the closure, where to go and look for the symbol. By default, it would go look in it for the surrounding class where it got generated from, which is called the owner. But you can tell it to go look anywhere else, and that's called a delegate. And you can actually set a delegate, and this is where the, some of the nice things come in. For instance, let's say we have those two classes. Foo has a method on it, or well, has a property on a target, and then I have the bar class. And we have to do something <coughs> method, and it takes a closure. What I can now do is take that closure and change the delegate to the foo data member. And so instead, when I actually call it down here, I do something, I say target equals 10, it's not going to find it inside the bar class at all because there's no target. But of course, I set it to foo. It actually goes off to the foo object now. It says, hold on, he's got a target. I'll call that. That makes sense. I see some frowns. Yes. Yes, if it's dynamically compiled, it would throw a missing method exception. Now, I'm not going to cover that really too much, but you can then program something. You can put a, a method in your class called missing method and then delegate all of those ones into there and do something with it. Right, so this is kind of more magic you can do. If you have a, a specific method called call in your class, it means you can actually call the class object as a, bit, a function. Sounds a bit like a functor then, isn't it? C++. So instead of having something down here at the bottom that's as ugly as that, uh, by putting the, the closure on there, I can just say foo curly braces. And you can actually do it as well. You don't have to necessarily put closures in there as the parameters to uh, a call. You could put anything else. Um, then it has this, what you call the Elvis operator which makes it a lot easier. Normally, I mean, if you use the C++, then you would know you can do the ternary operator. But then you have this kind of thing. But what if I only want to use the other value, like the default value, if the thing is already set? And this is pretty much what it does. You can say, if A is not set, use the thing behind it. So I will print foo there because A isn't set. But because B is set, 
it will actually print a value of B. And then we have what is the safe navigation operator. Uh, so instead of having to write reams and reams of code of saying, if is this null, is that null, et cetera, then do this. You can use the safe navigation operation, which also now I see appeared in the Kotlin language. I don't know which other. I think Ruby is the same kind of thing. And what you pretty much can say is, if A is null, then don't call it. If A is not null, then call the method afterwards. So we have the two kind of things. So where A is null, the result of that operation is going to be null. But where, because B is a null, it's actually going to give us the size of the string is three. But it won't throw an exception. So you can safely actually shorten all of your checks for is classical as null to something very, very short. However, if you don't use it, like in the last example, it will throw you a null pointer exception. Sorry? Oh, NT, null pointer exception. That's quite a common acronym in the Java world. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right, so another little thing is the spread operator. Uh, it's like a short way of doing a for each. So I might have an array there, a list of items, and I want to perform an operation on each of them. All I have to do is star dot something. So I do star dot size in that case, and it gives me a new array with that operation performed on it. Okay, so you can actually do other ways. There's like additional methods in Groovy to do more than that, but it's a very, very quick way of actually doing operating on a, on a single list and applying an operation to everything. Now, in the old days, people used to complain about Groovy. I said performance is a dynamic language, etc. Uh, some of that is sort of true. Uh, it depends actually how you write your code as well, but you can compile Groovy statically. And um, Russell has done a lot of tests on it. And he's actually got some data where he's shown some of the code to be, depending how you do it, could be as fast as Java. And this also brings up a little kind of argument sometimes is, do I write Java like first because it's faster? And then the kind of arguments we've gone through, we personally have done for some startup stuff, is to say we write everything in Groovy because we get stuff into the market a lot quicker. And if it's then too slow, we'll worry about it of optimizing it later. And that has actually helped us a lot. So this kind of, I don't think the speed of integration is, is a big factor. Of if you want to get something with business value as quickly, this is a quick way to actually write code and then worry about the optimization at the point where it really starts to matter. Now, there's a couple of annotations that you can apply. So if you apply on a class or a method, you can say compile static or compile dynamic. That will force that to be compiled in that way. The great thing is if you use compile static a lot, like an IntelliJ or things like that, it will pick it up at that time. If you're used to like using Java with all of the, the checks you can find in something like Eclipse and IntelliJ, with compile static, you sort of basically get the same kind of benefits. You have a compile time check. You get another version which is type check, which will do the type checking for you at compile time, but it will leave the code dynamic. Um, there are some benefits sometimes in doing that because especially if you ship certain kind of APIs, having a dynamic API is quite useful. Right. So remember that somebody actually says Groovy is that slow, or it's just dynamic, it isn't actually. You can, it can do quite a lot of stuff with it. And there's been a lot of work done in that um, area to actually make it faster. Well, I've already spoken about that. And I think that's the last kind of thing I want to sort of mention. In the old days, we used to have this kind of argument that said, well, we write stuff in C++, and if it's fast enough, we'll write it in C. And if it isn't fast enough, we'll write it in assembler. I think to a great extent, this applies on a JVM nowadays as well. So I will write a lot of stuff in Groovy. If it simply isn't fast <coughs> enough, I will find another language to write it in that's faster, that part. But I like to get stuff to the market as quickly as possible. The only thing is that I think the fastest implementation of JVM today for passing JSON is actually written in Groovy. It's interesting. So. Right, so if you want to go read about Groovy, it's actually part of Apache nowadays. And apparently since it joined the Apache group, it, the downloads has, has increased many fold. The documentation is online, and there's even a Twitter account for it. So I'm not actually going to speak much more about Groovy. If you have the questions about Groovy or any of the examples we've shown, we can talk about it. But that's pretty much 
the basics you need to know sort of the magic behind Groovy because and I think it's the, the minimum you should actually know if you want to use some of these tools. Right. Questions? I think now you can coerce a closure into a Lambda. So I think if you now call, I can't remember which version of Groovy it was, if you, if you call a closure and you call a, a method on Java that takes a Lambda, it coerces to that. Actually, those are the, and that kind of thing, there's a lot of coercion going on in Groovy. For instance, if you have an interface in Java and you have to implement it, you can actually write it as a map and coerce it, and it becomes a, a class. So you don't necessarily have to do the anonymous class that you sometimes have to do in Java. So there's a couple of little kind of coercions that you can perform. You can also curve a map into a closure if you want. Right, so before I can move on to this, I think one of the great tools that came out of the Groovy world has been Gradle. And um, as a build tool, I consider this one of the most modern build tools. And I've written, I've been around build tools for a long time, and I have a perverse affinity for build tools. I like playing with them. And I've written some very, very complex build tools, uh, build systems with Make, which I never want to repeat in my life. And looking back at it, I just wish I had something like Gradle at that time, because of a lot of things that it can do. But the, the sort of involvement we had of build tools is like we had sort of I want to, let's call them first generation things, because before Make, we really just probably had some kind of script to do it. But take Make and that kind of family as the first generation of tools. And it's been, I don't know, Make's been around for a long time. And I think it really sort of started with the, the Java people, and then eventually they decided, oh, we don't want to build Java code with Make. It's just painful. So it came up with Ant. And because XML was really cool at that time, <laughs> the and build scripts are all in XML. But and still had a problem, you still had to make sure if you manage all these dependencies, etc. and people still write um, their projects in any kind of way. And it sort of involved when Maven came about. And Maven brought two very, very important things to, to building software. And the first was dependency management. And you can actually store metadata about dependencies and the dependencies somewhere in a repository. And if you use something, it will pull the metadata for that repository, work out what's everything that's transitive, and also pull all those dependencies down. That was his first great, effectively, I wanted to call it a revolution, but his first brick innovation at came. And the, the second one is actually brought in this concept of convention and building projects in a your source code in. And all of your test codes will be under source test. And that's the kind of things that Maven brought. Um, effectively, we'll also call it convention over configuration. So Gradle inherited a lot of that. But Gradle didn't stop there, because it wasn't just a better Maven. And sometimes people want to compare the two, and it isn't really a comparison. Um, Gradle brought with it the first thing is readability, um, a lot easier to write um, build scripts, and a lot uh, are really a lot easier to read. I mean, anybody that has written ever a complex full script in Maven would know. XML isn't cool. Yes. So Maven works well for certain environments. If you follow the Maven way, it's good. Try to do something else in your world of pain. Now, the concept of Gradle actually using Groovy as the underlying language to create a DSL isn't new, but because long before Gradle there was this thing called SCON. I don't know, some people in this room might have used scones, which effectively uses the same principle of using Python underneath as the DSL language, which gives you a very big advantage. You can, as long as you follow the DSL, it's simple to read, etc. But if you need flexibility, you can always farm out and use the programming language to do the extra. But the danger of that is, of course, you can write unreadable scripts. But I guess we can write in unreadable code in any language. Uh, and there's a lot of build tools nowadays that sort of follow the same kind of thing. I mean, the SBT tool, which you probably should never use if you can avoid it, which is all done in Scala. Um, the Lenenigan tool, which is all done in Clojure. So, and there's Cobalt, which is 
the new Google tool, which is effectively DSL is based upon Kotlin. So this, those kind of things is sort of the evolving new generation of Google tools. And I think at some stage we'll get to a point again where we sort of try to push the, the language out of it and just go to a proper DSL. But that's how Google tools evolve. Now, let's just move on. I'm talking about it. So I pretty much mentioned most of this. The one thing I said Gradle, it's got a lot of plugins. And writing plugins isn't that hard for it either. So if you want to do, find a plugin to push something to Edge free, you will find a plugin to do it. Right, so there's a basic Gradle script. Um, and this one is effectively, we want to get a build some and test some stuff. We just apply a plugin. In this case, we can say we want to build a Groovy project. And we tell it the repositories we want to pull our artifacts from, and then we can list a whole bunch of dependencies. And this got this kind of thing of configurations, and we'll get to that. But that's a very, very simple script. Uh, and in fact, if you do a Java project, it's pretty much will look the same. At the end of it, I'll get how to do a C++ project with Gradle. But let's, uh, let's stick with uh, the JVM for the moment. Uh, a couple of nice things you can do is with all of the plugins, you can do all sorts of kind of things. And uh, you can do a lot of integration, testing, unit testing, functional tests. You can build it into the build script. The great thing is about it is that Gradle can actually bootstrap anything. So if you write in, a, in the correct way, somebody doesn't have to install a lot of tools. They can actually bootstrap the whole project by just checking out of the repo and run the script. And, it, and the script will actually like bootstrap everything for you. And what this actually gives you, where a lot of people earlier used to say, well, I don't have this on my machine. I can't test it. Like with Gradle, you can actually bootstrap up Docker instances. and uh, you can test a lot of things in Docker, so this kind of things make it a lot easier. And a good example is I've done things where we had to test things against MySQL. So I didn't want to install a MySQL instance somewhere. So I just fired up a Docker MySQL instance in the Gradle test, or as part of the test. And it fired it up, it ran the test, and it teared down the Docker instance afterwards. So it was all local. And you can do a lot of other things, but that's just a simple example. Now, what I want to actually start with is just showing actually how powerful it is. So I can do a little polyglot example. Um, so what I want to do is build a little application and pull it in different kind of languages. So I can actually going to use some Java, Groovy, and Kotlin in this example. And throw it all together, mix it up, and then I'm going to bundle it as an application which I can distribute as a zip. Okay, right. That's my project. That's the whole build script, right? So I'm going to apply a couple of plugins, and then I can give some dependencies, like you know, like with Groovy, I have to tell it what the standard library is for Groovy, which version would you use. The same thing with Kotlin. Then we're going to test it with something called Spock, which we're going to have a look a little bit later. And then eventually, when I've zipped it up with shell scripts to run, I'll need to know which is the correct um, JVM class to pull in. So I just list it there. So that's all of that. So have a look at it. Actually, see if I can pull that one up. <coughs> right. Right. So this is my little project. Uh, it's already laid out. It's got a build script there, which you just seen. It's effectively there's a little bit extra, but the main things you already seen on the screen. So I push it up a bit, and you can see it on the back. And then it has my source folder, and in my source folder, I have a couple of files. Now, this is my effectively. You see the source main area. There's all of the source code for running the app. Uh, I have some Kotlin code here. I have Groovy and Java code. It's actually interesting when you see I've got some Java code in the Groovy folder. This is fine because languages like Groovy and Kotlin allows you to do um, dual compilations. You can compile Java code as part of that folder with your, your local code. So that's what I've actually done. And then I've got some Groovy code that which actually tests all of this. And I can now run it. I've got my Gradle a, um, alias to a little other but if we just run it, 
you'll see actually Gradle starts up there, it builds it, it actually now tells you the, the task is going through. So you see it's done the Kotlin. Of course, there's no Java code in its own, so it's just going to say it's up to date, it's compiled Groovy. Then it's actually compiled the test classes, it's ran the test project to test it, and it's finished. And you also see somewhere there, it's, it's got a task called this zip, so it's building a zip of my application in. So I can actually find that. So everything by default in Gradle goes into a build directory. And we'll actually see there's my jar that got built. But well, we'll look inside that jar first. Just because we can. And there's my classes that got compiled into it. However, the thing we're really interested in is the distribution. Let's look inside the zip file. Okay, now we can actually see it's packaged up my application jar in there, all of the dependencies, and it's put two scripts in here. One that will run in a Unix world and one that will run Windows, and I can actually run it. Uh, so a very simple script, we can actually build stuff like, and try to do this with any other tool tool today. That's, that's my point. Uh, if you want, we can run it, but Gradle actually allows you to run this directly out of So you don't even have to unpack it, so you can test it. Oh, right, sorry, that's the wrong one then. Okay, you know, Gradle actually allows you to ask, this is another great thing about Gradle, you can actually say what are the tasks that's in my build, and it's actually gonna be in there. I just scroll up, so I my mouse. I think I mistyped it. There's run my little project. Okay. Right. Let's shift back. Okay, so the thing is, if you actually read this, you should be able to figure out what's going on here without too much of the effort. And this is kind of thing that makes this kind of the groovy based world really great. And I mean Gradle is pretty effective in this kind of way. And I know at least one person has used Gradle, two probably. So I don't know if anybody else ever used Gradle. Yeah, okay, there's a couple more, so you know. Um, so Gradle has a lot of, dependency management is pretty easy. You can, this, um, it uses the Maven coordinates by default to uh, specify dependencies. You can specify classifiers, extensions, et cetera, as well if you need to do extra. Um, you can, and they are specify what we call configurations. So in this kind of context, we have compile and test compile, which is called configurations in Gradle speak. And if this runs, it will only put those dependencies on the class path for that specific task. So it does all the class path management for you, etc. So when it runs a test, it will put everything from compile plus everything from test compile on your class path. And that's all specified, you see this in the dependencies closure. And it will then go off and pull it from different repositories, whatever you specify. And the kind of repository today is like JSON, the Maven Central. Um, and then you can configure your own Maven and Ivy repositories as well. So if you store other kind of binary artifacts, in, um, especially Ivy, you can pull it down. You can use local directories. And so it gives you quite a bit of um, flexibility of pulling things down. The only thing it doesn't really, isn't great with today, and it's not necessarily its own fault, is there's no great way of managing dependencies for native binaries. There's no simple solution for it. And I know there's people working on that. I mean, you can try stuff like zero conf, et cetera, but um, it still doesn't quite work as nicely as the kind of things we got used to in the JVM world. I mean, at least the .NET world caught up by putting NuGet in there, but it's still not quite the same. But it gives you this kind of thing. So actually, you can even call things from NuGet you use Gradle if you want. Now, 
there's a couple of ways you can say you can specify repositories. The nice thing is if you like I use Ivy style repositories, then you can actually use that and abuse it to pull things from other file layouts as well, but you're just specifying your own file layout. We've actually used that before as well, so you can't pull anything. I've actually even pulled stuff from GitHub using that directly. Then there's a special block called build script. Uh, I think they've tried to sort of deprecate it, but they can't completely do it. The way that Gradle works, it loads up the script, it looks at it, it actually executes that script before it executes the build, and that execution of the script really creates two phases, what I call the configuration phase, and then later the script actually gets executed as an execution phase. And it happens with a bit of class loader magic. But the great thing is that this is also this kind of thing called build script. And you put anything in there that you need to be on the class path when Gradle actually tries to compile the build script to execute it. So there's a lot of class path things going on. You just have to know where to put things in. Now, it's actually, since Gradle 2.1, they've got a simpler way of putting plugins in, so you don't have to use the old way. But it's there. Um, Another thing you come across in the syntax is this thing called extensions. And for instance, in the uh, JRuby plugin, you have this kind of block in there called JRuby, and then there's a default version. And rather that specifies the version of Ruby it wants to use. But you get a lot of these kind of blocks in Gradle, which is like extension blocks, where you can configure things globally, because they are effectively the same as global data. And then all of the other tasks that apply to that can use it, or any other task, or any, anything else you do, you can actually use it from the extension. Now, I spoke about a lot of things. I never spoke about a task. You sort of saw tasks pop by when we did a little example. But I mean, in reality, a build system isn't anything without targets or tasks. So in Gradle, you, can, you have a lot of this actually being given as default. If you apply plugins, to add more. But you can define your own ones as well. So I can define a simple one based upon if I want to ex execute something external, there's an exec task. And I, now you can sort of see the things that we spoke about Groovy before in the sense that there's the args um, parameter down there. It doesn't make any ugly syntax around it. It actually, you can see very, very clearly what it is. And I guess if I ask anybody what that exact task are, they can probably explain to me. Okay, so you can also create your own free form things by using the little chevron in there. Ooh, and I have a mistake in mind, so we're just gonna skip that one. Uh, but generally with tasks, most of them are actually supplied um, via plugins, as I said, and you just configure them. You put all the parameters in what you do, and Gradle will figure the rest out for you. If, since given us always talk about C++, yeah? If you want to build C++ with Gradle, you can. And you don't even have to shell out. So you can start. Let's talk about it. So there's apply plugin TPP. That's your base that you have to start from. Um, and then you have to configure the DSL. And I think we go back. So we start with that. Um, so, as I said, Gradle likes this convention over configuration approach. So by default, and I think people, some people might hate this, but they start by you say you should actually put your projects in a CPP folder, and then there's a name. So the name of the little module you want to build goes in there. So you put into like, if I want to build a Hello World, I can do source Hello World CPP. Put all my C++ files in there. But then I have to do source, hello world, headers, put all my header files in there. And I know if you come from the old world where you throw all of your C++ and header files in one directory, this sounds really alien. So I think to some extent this might sometimes still prevent people from that. They don't really want to move to this kind of model. It actually works quite well. Um, it sticks everything in the right directory. It does that part of you. So you don't have to go and manipulate everything and make, for instance, to do this. But you can override it. Sorry? Uh, that is a standard layout, yes, and you can override it. Let's see if you can override it. Well, I said we can. Uh, there. Yeah, you can override it. Um, you can put it wherever you want, kind of things. That gives you the flexibility. Um, and you just have to say, find my CPP sources here instead of, you know, in the standard area. But you see, this is the kind of thing we have convention over configuration. If your things are placed in the convention, you can write a very, very short script. Now, you can also override the compilers. By default, it would look on, if it's, it sees as Windows, it will go look for the Visual C++ compiler. If it sees on Linux or anything, it would look for GCC first, and then I think it will look for Clang. 
And it has a couple of things that we can go through. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. So these are the tool chains that are supported officially. And there's some that are not officially supported, but they do test against it. So right, they will do GCC on Mac, etc. And you just have to supply what kind of, um, if you want to use a specific tool chain, you have to say that. But if you don't, it will just default whatever is default on that platform. Which is the great thing is if you write a C++ build script and you put it in a repo and somebody pulls it down a different platform, if that's a compiler install, it should theoretically compile, provided the code is obviously portable. Now, oh, okay, so we're going to look at it. So if you want to build an executable, it's got this sort of syntax, which I don't think it's the greatest. I think it can be better, but that is what it is today. So they work now, they, they, in the old days of Gradle, they had, they had a sort of way of working. And then when they realized, oh, we want to build C++, they realized, oh, the old JVM model doesn't quite apply. And they're starting to evolve the whole of Gradle now to a component model. So you have to specify which components you want to build. And then you give it a name. So you're going to build it as a Hello app. And we can say it's an executable. And you have to use that specific word. You have to know it's that. It's in the documentation, but you have to know you want to build an executable. So what we're having here is a native executable specification. If I just specify that, it knows it's going to go off and look and source Hello CPP for my C++ code. And it knows it's going to compile an executable. It's going to put it somewhere under build. Um, let's look at that before we go to that slide. Come on. Let's see if we can find that app. So they are my little hello app as well. Um, and that's the kind of layout. And if we actually look at this, this specific project where I've got it in, which is actually much more complex, you will actually see two important things about Well, I hope it's going to show it. Created this thing, the project called Hello. What you'll actually see is created a task called Hello Executable, which is the task that actually will build the executable. And then it's got like an installed task as well that is added. So it adds a couple of tasks by default just because I've applied the C++ plugin. Okay, so that's the now I see you can actually change the the tool chain, you can. And in one case, I've actually worked somewhere where I tried to have some of the people who are actually building all of the C++ code in their own cheroot. Okay, so I've changed it, put a little shell script in there, which fires up the cheroot, and then calls the compiler with the correct arguments. And it all works. So the flexibility of this is actually pretty powerful. So you can actually override it, tell it where your specific compiler is. In that case, I actually said, my compiler is GCC, but the path is this, and you actually execute root with the extra parameters. And um, it just works. So there is actually a lot you can actually get off it if you want to have a build tool where you have to especially build polyglot, you can do this kind of things. That's, that's pretty simple. And that is pretty much actually what we actually want to do. Actually, in terms of Gradle, you can do a lot with it. And I think especially now that it's getting better and better with building native apps, uh, it's definitely something to look for in the future if you want to um, build um, your new project. Now, it's very powerful in the sense it supports variants, multi-platform, et cetera. So you can build variants and specify them in the build script very easily. And especially, or you can build different architectures. So if you're used to building 32-bit and 64-bit on a platform, you can specify the talent whether you should build it or not build it. You can do all of those kind of things. And the syntax. Although, in my personal opinion, not simple, it's still a lot simpler than many other build tools I've seen. I mean, if you ever use Visual Studio and you try to edit the XML file that that creates for MS Build, 
Okay, well, let's not go there. Let's, let's, let's talk about better things in life. Um, as I think I've alluded to many times, I think in the C++ world for Gradle, it's evolving, it's getting better. Um, I think DSL can be slicker. It supports CMake, but it doesn't support auto tools. It depends whether it's important for you or not. Uh, but I think a lot of the things where auto tools used to be important in the past is falling away with the kind of things we are building. So I wouldn't necessarily make that a prerequisite. So if you're interested in Gradle, uh, there's a website and the kind of things that's pretty easy to find. There's also a Gradle Twitter account. There's also a daily Gradle Twitter account, which tweets one tweet. Ah, one tweet. It tweets one tip a day. It shouldn't actually come up with those tongue twisters anymore. One tip a day and about Gradle, and I mean, it doesn't flood you with lots of other things, and normally goes over at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So if you're interested in Gradle, that's a useful account to follow. Oh, yes, I forgot to say, I wrote a book about Gradle. If you're interested in writing plugins for Gradle, there's a book. Okay, we'll move on. That's just a little bit of... Um, yeah, okay. Thank you. But we will need to move on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. I've talked about bowling stuff. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, a relationship between gradient and image. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that support for CMake? Well, Gradle has built in support for CMake. So uh, if you've got a CMake file, I think it can interpret a CMake file and it will build the project. as I know. I personally I see make I hate it. But if you've got it, yes, you can try. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 But you can actually you should actually go and read about it, but it's got specific support for CMake. Uh, and it was done purposefully because they knew it's that's just to get people moving over to Gradle it would be one thing to do. Um, there's just a note, actually, if you use Gradle, it's got very easy ways of converting from Maven and Ant into um, Gradle. It's, that's pretty trivial as well. Okay. Let's move on to testing. Here's a little test report. I thought I'd start with it this way. Um, and I guess a lot of people are familiar with BDD style things, doing things. Right? Anyone not familiar with BDD or Gherkin? Okay, it seems to be happy. Okay, but let's just have a look at this test. So I, let's say I build a simple calculator, and here's my test. So I want my calculator to add numbers. It's pretty obvious. But, um, and given that I have fired up this calculator, if I add a couple of numbers, I expect a certain answer. Right, now, think for a moment, whatever language you're gonna write it, how are you gonna write a test for this? Uh, so I assume a lot of people write stuff on a JVM, let's say JUnit. Or let's just think if you do it in C++ as well, you might write it in, um, sorry? Yeah? GMark. Yeah, GMark. Okay. There's a couple of things. So you've got a couple of, you've got an idea in your head in how many lines of code this is going to be and et cetera. Okay. Right. 
Let's write a test that way. So we go back. You see the text that I had there. So we've got it up there. So I've got my test. I said my calculator must be able to add numbers. And given that I have that calculator, when I add 2, 3, and minus 20, then I expect the answer to be minus 15. So I have the human description in there, and then I have code. All right. If you've never seen this code, do you think you could read it? I don't say you should understand how it works, but you can read it. So this is actually, I think, one of the big things that Ruby has brought to testing on a JVM. And the example I showed earlier, I tested all of those three languages, Groovy, Java, and Kotlin, with this tool. Um, and actually, I want to stick it, I'm not going to tell you what the tool is yet. If there's another kind of page, which is also report, let's look at what happens if that tool fails. Let's say um, my tool returns minus 13. All right, oh, I, 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 no, actually, let's say I wrote my test in a good way, which is break it first before it runs. And I say it should be 13, but the, the calculator works at a turn minus 15. So I get this little report here, but notice this. It actually tells me, so we go back to the previous one. It says answer equals, equals minus 15. Oops. It actually tells me the answer was minus 15, but my, on the other side of the equation was minus 13. So you actually get a failure that tells you not only that it's failed, but where it's failed. Right. And taking my original report, we can have the same kind of thing, and um, it will tell me where it's failed. So this is a useful report to give to somebody without having the code. But it's better than a lot of other reports. Well, you can actually think, I can actually write a whole bunch of these things. Somebody can review it. Did you test all of these features? And I can have this whole report. How do we get to this? We'll start with this thing. It's called Spock, Spock Framework. It sits on top of JUnit 4. So any place, anywhere, you can use JUnit. Any framework, you can use Spock. You don't have to write any JUnit. You just write Spock. Uh, and what's great about it is much more than just use it for plain unit testing. It's built in stubbing and mocking. So you don't have to pull in anything like Mockito or anything else. And, um, and you can test basically nearly any language on the JVM. Uh, with, I have a friend which actually he does a lot of presentations. He does a lot of stuff on Scala. And he does one presentation where he actually tests Scala code with, with Spock. And if you use any other kind of framework, I think this is one of the great frameworks you can use. And understanding the basics of Spock also means you can use some of the other tools that we actually uh, will quickly show you. Right, so let's look at another Spock example. You all know data-driven testing. Okay, so we're going to do another one here. So we're going to give it, we're going to do a multiplication test. We're going to do a couple of tests here. So um, we want to multiply different numbers. Notice that we can actually do a couple of things here. Firstly, we have this thing, the answer is, but I don't see the number, I say hash answer. And then I have these little hashes in there. And then I have this, this strange notation, which just looks like a table, which is effectively the input and the expected output. Now, that is valid, actually, groovy to some extent. But it gets done by what's called annotations to transform it. But you can actually, by looking at CR support, it, and we use this little annotation on top called an unroll, which takes each of those data steps and puts it into a separate test. So you know if you can do sort of data-driven testing with JUnit, et cetera, but everything ends up in the same test. So with unroll, it actually splits everything out. So that single test I wrote was actually now three tests. And let's say one of them failed. The report will actually tell me exactly that Lotus has now substituted my hashes and said the answer is to be one and the operation is one, two, three, two, the other. It gives me the whole pattern. The other one is pretty simple. Now it actually tells me each of the parameters that I've passed, what the values were, and what the answer was. So it's very, very easy to diagnose a problem just from a report without even having to dig into the code. So you know where to go and look. Yeah. Okay, so we can test exceptions easily. We can do something like, well, obviously it's gonna, you don't want to have to divide by zeros. So you know it has to throw an exception, so you can test it to throw an exception. So 
it remains pretty simple. Um, we can mock out interfaces. Let's say we have some kind of remote calculator interface. Let's just define as an interface. All I have to do is that, say mock, give it an interface name. And then I can test at the bottom whether that function got called, how many times it got called, with what parameters got called, etc. So in this case, I only wanted to test whether it got called once. I didn't care which parameters got passed. So I just put an underscore in. You can do a lot of things like that. So it makes your testing a lot more complex. You don't have, I mean, I normally complain about stuff like JUnit because you have to say assert, 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 assert. And then it throws an assertion and you have to go back in the code, you have to look what line it was. Okay, it's asserted on that one. So this makes it a lot easier. Okay, so any questions about Spock? You can go find it there, Spock framework. This special report I showed you is an extra jar you have to apply. It's called Spock reports. Um, otherwise, you just get the standard little report, which like Red Ocean gives you. All right, so we move on. What about website testing? Who does website testing? What tools do you use? Selenium, yeah. Anybody use anything else than Selenium? Cucumber with Capybara. Um, okay. Right, but so sort of most people use Selenium. And Selenium is good, right? Okay, it is. It's probably the most used tool. Um, but normally it's right Selenium. You can use Cucumber and Selenium as well. I think yeah. Capybara is on top yeah. of Selenium. Yeah. And um, the only thing about Selenium is it's very, very verbose. Well, not it's as verbose as Java goes if you write on a JVM world. Uh, if you write it with full, it's just unreadable. Uh, okay. Let's not go there. Right. <laughs> okay, let's test a simple example. Um, let's say we have this page with these checkboxes. We want to go to that page, navigate to it, and we want to check that the second checkbox is checked. Okay. That's my test code. Now, my underlying code is Spoc. And this is one of the reasons I think Spoc is great. So it's going to give me the first bounce of um, readability and short code, and then I put something else on top of it. Now, let's look at it. So when I go to that internet site, so I said I'd go to whatever the route was. Don't worry about web routes. Let's just say we've defined it as a variable. And slash checkboxes. Then I'm checking to find that text on there. Uh, so I'm looking for an H3 element of which the value is checkboxes. And I want to check that my checkboxes, the one is set and the other one isn't. Okay, so I do this sort of short kind of thing. Find the ID, which is sort of something you know from Selenium. You can get by ID. Checkboxes. I want to find the next part down as an input. I use Groovy spread operator, and I say find a checked element on each of those, and it returns me a value. And I can check the first one is set, the second one. Oh, first one is not set, and the second one is set. Yes. Ah, yes. I oh, will get to it. Okay. So yes, it is bound to a browser. Um, it's bound. What I'm going to show you. Uh, hold on. I'll, I'll get there. Right. This is the tool. It's mentioned it. It's called Jeb. So Jeb sits on top of Selenium. Um, and it works with a bunch of other unit testing frameworks. Yeah, it makes Selenium readable, yes. Um, and anything you can do in Selenium, you can do in Jeb. You just do it shorter. So, yes, you bind to your browser. Whichever you want to do in Selenium using the Firefox driver, the Chrome driver, JBr oh, don't use JBr as a driver. It doesn't work that well. Uh, there's still problems with that. But yes, standard kind of browsers you want to do, or if you want to bind to um, source labs, anything of that, you can do that. So you get all of the power, but now you get the readability as well. Okay. Pop up. There's another little one. Um, it's the same kind of thing. We just want to do that. But this is different. Um, that's a complete thing that I've done. But notice what we've done here, normally with a, a Spock test, you will say extends exception, a specification. Now with Jeb, if you, instead of ex extending um, the specification class, you extend the Jeb spec class, which gives you a bunch of extra stuff. So it's easy to do just something like Go. Um, it puts an extra cover. Of, or we can call it keywords if you want, but it puts that in there. And then via the other things I explained earlier, delegation, and 
Delegation actually helps you to resolve where those symbols are. But with Jeff, I can also record screenshots. I can actually browse and I can record screenshots of the journey as I browse and then put as part of my report. So it will always record the last one when it's finished, but you can tell it to go in between as well. So instead now of extending JEP spec, I use JEP reporting spec. And then after I've gone to the website, I can say the report and I give it a name. And it will snapshot that screen and store it. And in the end, you can actually find all of those screenshots as part of your test report. And I'm sure people actually, that's quite useful. And you can either find HTML and PNG, etc. Okay, so that screenshot was the one that was grabbed from the full site. By the way, if you want to play around with uh, testing websites and stuff, there's this nice little thing that runs on a Roku. It's on GitHub as well. It's done by Elemental Selenium. And it's got all sort of broken and good screens, and you can test different things. So if you want to play around and learn, it's also a good site to use. Right, Jeb, once again, it's got a Twitter account. It's got an uh, ad on the site called Jebish. So it's not Geb or anything. They say the guy is great. He's called it Jeb, like more. And I think we we'll, want to spell it J-E-B, but that's a, 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 um, the way you pronounce it. Okay, so it's Jebish.org. Right. Yes. So I'm not going to spend much time on it. Go to the site and read about page objects. It's got a special thing where you can actually build pages. Yeah. This one, I will get, I'll give you the link for that. I can't remember it from memory. But it's actually called, if you, even if you just Google for GitHub space, the internet. It's called the internet. Yeah, the inter the dash internet. It's written in um, one of the Ruby frameworks. It works quite well. It's very useful. Okay, let's play with something else. Um, so we did some testing. What about writing a REST API? That's oh, okay. There it is. So it's basically reactive. So. Uh, we know now that so the sort of the kind of reactive pattern is sort of one of the better ways to writing web apps that's very responsive. So we have this framework called Redpack, built the top, it runs Java 8 only, uh, it's built the top of Netty, and it uses all the reactive principles. But you can write it in Java, you can actually, the nice thing is it's got a nice short groovy syntax on it. Uh, and let's have a look at that. Right, we're gonna run this app now. Uh, there's a little REST app. It only supports get, but you can see the kind of keywords there. Uh, if I just supply a, a plain get on the root, it's going to hello world. If I say get something else, it should give me something else. That is my whole web app and those couple of lines. So let's play with that one. Come on. Oh, I don't want to go there. So in this case, instead of building a whole thing, I'm just going to do it from a script. Um, the nice thing about this kind of approach is you do it in the script, you can package it up in Docker and just fire up a Docker instance and you will have a running web app. So, but we're just going to run it locally. It should hopefully be running. That looks good. Now, I keep on losing my mouse on the screen. We've got it running, and I think it's uh, probably port 50-50. Right. So let's talk to it. Hello, world. Or... There we go. 
Joe, hello, Joe. OK, so it's a pretty simple um, little app that can run. And it's um, all back there. So you can see, actually, if you write one of things very quickly, you can just think about how many do it in any kind of other framework, how long things can take. But this is a very, very quick thing to be able to fire up. Um, obviously, you can go pack it up like in a, a proper like Gradle project or anything and build more out of it if you want. Um, there's even a Rat Pack plugin for Gradle, which does a bit of extra bits for you. But if you want to fire up something very quickly, this is the way you do it. And just to mention, right on top there, you'll see this thing called Grape and Grab. Those are specific annotations that Groovy provides, and it actually allows you to pull down the dependencies you need with all of Trans's dependency and put it in a class path when you run the script. So some people, this might not be the thing you want, but um, it is actually a quick way to start things up. So that is Redpack. But Redpack offers something else that I like. It's got a test HTTP client. So I want to test another HTTP site very, very quickly. Um, and I can actually use the standalone. So those are the Maven coordinates if you need a dependency. And I can run this. Um, so I am going to have some kind of application that I'm going to load. So we've got two sets of code here. Let's look at the bottom one first. Um, I'm going to send some code to this, this app that I've got. And I'm going to post it. And then I can check the status code back and look at the response. Okay. So I've prepared this one for another presentation as well. So there's definitely lots of interesting characters in there, which is a good thing of testing your stuff, because when I started this thing, the first time I wrote everything in English, and, and it worked, until I stuck the extra characters, and then I realized I wrote, I had a bug in my um, little web app that I wrote. So, so it's always good to test with Unicode. Right, so, but this is basically kind of, thing that I actually set up. So I want to create some kind of payload with HTTP client, send it over there, and then just check the things that come back. So you can see the test is relatively simple. I've done two extra tricks in here because um, what Ratpack needs is this thing they call an application under test. So you have to create one of those and then tell it where the URL is. And then I've done the fancy trick. This is called delegate. So delegate is a special annotation. And if you put it in your Spock test, anything it can't resolve in the Spock test, it will go ask that specific object where it's got a method. So that client method has got a post on it, it's got a request spec on it, it's got a response on it. But I don't have to write everything. So I don't have to say client.request spec, client.post, etc. So this little thing makes it a lot shorter to write your code. Okay. We've got 20 minutes left. So cool. Are you, how are people actually feel it? It sort of, sort of blows your mind away or you think this is very, very complex or you actually think this is much, actually, might make my life easier to read and to write code? Um, it will probably look more of this. Yeah. Um, for most things, if you just do things like the plan, get this, um, put kind of examples, it should be relatively simple. It depends what kind of manipulation you start doing around it. Uh, yeah. I guess for me, it's a bit of a problem when you're running a plan down and you've got to make it up. It's a lot of You can, uh, yeah, this is in, once you get to interaction, yes, once you get to interaction, it's going to get more complex. Um, but it still will be more simple to read, I think. It depends how you write it, but you have to, uh, so especially if you do like JIP and things like that, then it's worthwhile farming those things onto like page classes and then call those ones. Just makes it a bit easier. Uh, but it's also, if you write, if your test code gets too complex, then sometimes you have to wonder what you're doing. Uh, the idea is we want to read things as simple, but I think that the point is you are completely right about it. They get to a point where things get too complex again. And 
usually, hopefully, then somebody gets to a point where they say, oh, this is too complex, I'll write a new tool to solve that problem. <laughs> very effectively, all of these tools came from because it got too complex to write other stuff. So we just want to make something simple that we can focus on, effectively want to play what's in front of us. Um, well, that is effectively what we've just done. You can point at any verbs and just throw things at The nice one I like is I want to do some quick testing. It's the kind of thing I like to use. Uh, and then I think so you might want to write your final stuff totally differently, but if you want to test things quickly, um, there are some good things you can try out of this. Um, we've done that. Right. Okay. Hmm. I've managed to actually do this quite well. So there are some other... I don't want to actually spend too much time on other tools because there's a lot of tools, but I'm just going to uh, go through a couple of these, and you can go read about it yourself. They all work with this kind of principle of we're trying to make some things simpler by making it easy to read. So the first one is Grails. Grails is very, very well known, actually. I don't know if anybody's written anything in Grails in this room. Um, it's primarily still an MVC kind of tool, but they change a lot of the stuff with the new Grails 3. You can plug in different kind of things. You can make it a pure REST um, web server, or you can make it a full application server, etc. It's got one that combines very nicely if you want to do both the REST back end and the front end. It com combines with Angular, etc. But what's nice about it is you actually effective to a great extent only define your domain classes. Uh, and then you can decide how you want to back put the back end in. So you can use anything that supports Hibernate. You can support Cassandra and anything of those kind of tools in the back end as well. So it takes care of a lot of that for you. And then you can decide how you want to have your, your UI done as well. Um, using some of the tools to plug in. But it becomes a lot simpler. Um, it sits on top of Spring, actually. So once again, it makes Spring more useful. Uh, just have an extra layer. And they do pretty complex stuff in, in Grails to make you actually able to develop um, web apps a lot easier. Um, and I want to let's just go to Grails.org if you want to find it. Then, this question, who still write desktop apps here? Desktop apps. Yeah, a Qt or a Java or something. Uh, no, desktop. Yeah, <laughs> you still do desktop. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not the biggest thing. But but if you have to write your own desktop app, I mean, like especially the old Java world was either old days was struts and things like that, and then there was um, Swing, of course. Huh? What's it called? <laughs> yeah, it's too old then. Let's move on, let's move on. But anyway, this is probably the simplest tool to write a desktop app with, a proper app. Um, it's a Griffin. And Griffin supports a lot of things. It actually supports Java FX now as well, so it supports a modern kind of UI look. It's sort of modeled on the same principles as Grails, so you just define your domain objects, etc. cetera. Um, and it starts building around there. So a lot of the kind of manipulation you have to do normally when building a desktop app, it takes care of. And you can actually build relatively complex apps in a very simplistic way. And somebody demoed one to me last year at GreatConf, and he's built this whole ast astronomy app where they actually plot all the stars and things. And he says, I would never have written it if I didn't have Griffin, because it was too much work. Otherwise, uh, and it was a pretty impressive app, I have to say. And we looked at the code, and I could actually, the code wasn't that big. So, yes, I mean, obviously, you're going to get to a point you have to do more prop complex things, so you're going to have to write more code. There's still the fact that the code doesn't get as complex and as unmaintainable. Then there's GrooScript. So, I think GrooScript was designed for people who like to write Groovy but doesn't want to write JavaScript. So you write your code in Groovy, and it spews out JavaScript for you. <laughs> it's like Opal in Ruby. It's the same kind of principle. You write stuff in Ruby, and on the other side, it spews out JavaScript. Actually, the Kotlin language has taken it further. The Kotlin language natively supports the JVM backend or JavaScript. So you still write in Kotlin, and it can spew any of you out for you. So I think there's something in the, in the lines that people don't like writing JavaScript, but they need JavaScript. So write this kind of tools. So you can use something like that. Uh, can do that for you. Then, um, oh, we can have a look at this example of the next one, maybe. Groovy VFS, uh, I'm going to plug this one because I wrote it. <laughs> it's just a tool for managing files on remote systems in a very, very 
simplistic way. Really. So if I want to pull a, a file from, say, an SFTP server over there, I want to push it to an FTP server over there or something like that, if you had to write it in Java or anything else, it gets pretty complex. Yeah, I can do this on a bash, but then it's easier. I can sort of write a bit of scripty things here and try to manipulate how I log into my SFTP server with not having a um, key for it, et cetera. So yeah, we, we can do that, but it just makes it a lot simpler, and it has a very intuitive uh, syntax. So if you have to do a lot of um, that kind of devops kind of things, this might be a very, very useful tool to use. Then along with that goes this thing called Sugar. And Sugar's got a little sister called Gruen. So uh, Sugar effectively is SSH and SCP support in Groovy, but in a, a very, very nicely DSL style way. And if you need to speak to Windows, you use Gruen. So it speaks um, WinRM. And this is normally a lot of the pains you have, a lot of things you can't manage your things on Windows. I mean, a lot of the tools that you now have for DevOps are still very painful. I mean, Ansible is the only one that does a decent job of really working with Windows compared to the other ones. So Groovin is a nice little tool. So we've got a couple of minutes. Let's skip over that page. We'll come back to that. Um, let's look at some bits of pieces. So there we go. Um, that's Groovy VFS. So let's say we use the same kind of example. I want to copy from one server. I want to copy a file, put it in another one. You can sort of see the syntax as half Unix-like. So I have CP in there, copy the two things. It makes a lot of sense. I tell it to overwrite. The other thing I can do up there is I want to force it to use passive mode. So I just put it in as a query parameter. So you can do all sorts of stuff like that. This is actually built on top of Apache VFS. But once again, there's all kind of things. Groovy VFS makes Apache VFS readable. <coughs> so a simple kind of thing. If you ever get into this kind of things, think about using it. That's the URL. Uh, and ah, OK, I, I did a simple one. Yeah, I just stuck the user and the password in there. Uh, yeah, you can avoid that. OK, but sometimes that's the simple kind of things you want to do. You can actually even encrypt the password and stick the encrypted version in there. Uh, I don't call it really encrypted because it's sort of encrypted, but if you run the decrypt utility, you always get it back. There is no special salt in it. Um, it's just an Apache utility, but you can do things like that. Uh, and you can stick the keys in, etc. So, And it supports a bunch of URLs, not just HTTP, etc. It does S3. Uh, I wrote one for S3, and we're playing and trying to do one of NFS, but I haven't got to finish that yet. But there is quite a number of uh, supported protocols for the kind of things you would normally use. So it's, it's quite useful for many cases. Uh, we just use it in a case we have to pull something from an FTP server in one project, an FTPS server, actually. So we pull it down there, we manipulate the XML on the fly that comes down, and we convert it to something that's useful. But the code is actually very, very short compared to having to have to write this in Java or anything else. So that's Groovy VFS. And then um, that's the sugar library. Once again, I just stuck the user ID and password in there. You can do it in a better way. But that's the kind of Groovy write. Uh, it uses a little closure, and the parameters set it up for a remote session. And then, as I said, I want to execute those commands on the remote server. And the last one is actually say, I've got a file on a remote server, and it's going to call this for file. I want to stick that text in it. Uh, you, were actually, you might remember, Jess, because we did a similar kind of thing when we I asked around if I want to do something in VFS. We do similar kind of things. Yeah, just easily just stick stuff in it. So those are kind of things that are really, really useful for a lot of little things you want to do. What happens if there's like any exception? Throw an exception. And then you have to handle it. You can write the exception code around it, OK? This is happy path code. <laughs> Otherwise, it will never fit on the screen <laughs> if you have to put all exception handling in. Um, but yes, you can do things like that. So <coughs> of course, it's, it's JVM basis. It will go through all of those kind of things you can get with the JVM. OK, and I think. That's the end. So, yeah, let's go. Right. Very nice. It's been a couple of minutes. Um, questions? Now we can, or we can play with any code if you've got a specific answer. Yeah. From Gradle to Maven. Okay, I don't have the example. Yeah, hold on. Let's see. 
See if I can make the screen a bit easier, if I can find my mouse on the screen. Yeah. A bit. Okay, so I'm just going to type in Gradle in here. So if you actually look in here, if you go to your Maven project, and this works for, unless it's a very, very complex Maven project, because you can only have 100% conversion. You can see in here there's a thing called if I can find it now. No. Uh, yeah, I can't find the thing in there now. If you can just generate. Okay, I'm not going to find it. There's an inner task on there. And if you say Gradle, in it, and then if you don't specify anything and it finds a POM XML in that directory, it will create you the Gradle script out of the POM file. You can explicitly tell it when there's, a, I think it's parameters minus minus in it, or minus minus project, I can't remember. I have to look that up. And you can tell it to create some other kind of projects as well, but your Maven creation is pretty much just doing that. And it, it will try to create you a um, equivalent Gradle script. Obviously, if you use specific plugins in Maven and things like that, it might not convert it properly. You have to do that part manually. Yeah. So, yeah, we were talking about calling Anstip. You can actually do your migration halfway. Still call the Anstip from Gradle and slowly migrate it in because Gradle has got native support for Ant, and the reason for that is because Groovy has got native support for Ant. Uh, so, yeah, you, can, you can actually pull your whole Ant file in as well, and they would automatically be converted to Gradle tasks. You just have to say, I think it's Ant.load file or something. You give it the bullet XML, and then they just get reflected. Yeah, that was, I think that was part of Russell's original contribution. More questions? No, okay, that's the thing I said. Is, um, with C++, it gets a bit too tricky. You can pull it using the existing mechanisms. Um, if like if you manipulate your IV, want to do it, and it can pull it down. But native manage, like that kind of dependency management isn't really mature in the native world. Um, if you can't do it, that VFS code, there's a plugin for the VFS for Gradle, and you can pull stuff from arbitrary sites. There's a VFS copy task, or you can just use the native um, VFS scripting inside um, Gradle, and it will also work. And I've done it with a couple of things. Actually, uh, talking about it, the slides, by the way, let's see if we can get a link to that. Before we finish off, I think there's one more. Yeah, okay. The slides I have shown you was built with Gradle. Uh, it's written in ASCII Doctor, which is a tool I really like, and it was styled with Reveal.js. I actually pulled down the Reveal.js template in the Gradle thing using the VFS plugin. But, um, okay. When I, I will actually post a link to this, it's all on GitHub, and you can actually see how it's been done. But I would pretty much, lots of things get written in ASCII Doctor now, it's a lot quicker. All of those test snippets you've seen were all tested as part of the build. So the code snippets you see are tested. Okay, cool. Anything else? Um, if we have time. Now we have three minutes. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing I, I typically have in, in the build tool I use is database 
Yeah. Do you have anything in the, through the ecosystem to that? Yeah. Use a tool called Liquibase. Yeah. Yeah, if you use that, there's a plugin for Liquibase also in Gradle, but just use Liquibase. Uh, well, I don't know if it's a replacement. It's just things sort of fall by the wayside over time, I think. Uh, yeah. Personally, I'm, I'm not evangelizing in the sense that so you should go to Gradle. No. Uh, the point is, I just think it is one of, it's like a next generation tool, which well, is, I yeah. 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 I would think if you can migrate stuff, it just becomes easier. And, and Which project? Oh, yeah, it could be. Well, the thing is, until somebody comes and writes the plugin. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just somebody wants to do it really so hard as they want to do it, and then. Okay. Looks like we're done. Right. Thank you very much.